you know, it would be swell to uh, just have a bit more fun with our spirituality, wouldn't it? And there is so much to be joyful about right now. So, you know, I kind of struggled with this talk title that was given to us. Uh, for those of you who don't know, every year a group of ministers get together and figure out a theme for the year and they fill in the talk titles and we're free to use them or not. And um, I put this talk title in not realizing how much it would be the topic on everybody's minds and hearts, um, probably second only to the coronavirus. Um, because this country is taking a good hard look at how we deal with race issues. And it's time. It's definitely time. But I have to, I have to confess, there was a part of me that took a deep breath and said, I'm tired of talking about this. I'm so tired of talking about this. And again, I recognize that that is white privilege. That because of the color of, of my skin, I can always step away from the issues of racism and pretend I don't have to look at them anymore. So I am going to look at them a little differently today. We are taught, or actually there was a point in time when people would say, I am blind to color. I don't see color. And it was meant to mean something positive, that I'm not going to hold your color against you. The challenge with that, as we have come to know, is that, first of all, that makes being a person of color a negative for which we will not blame them. And there's a distinct we and them in that. For another, and this is actually part of uh, my personal experience, because some of the people in my immediate family are people of color. Um, I don't look it. I got the Irish side, but we have a, a strong Arabic side as well. And if you tell me, if I was in darker skin and you told me you don't see color, then you just negated a large chunk of who I am. And that's why we no longer say things like, I don't see color, when what we mean to say is, I am an anti-racist. That is another term that has come up over time. Um, you are either pro-racist racism or anti-racism. And there is nothing in the middle, really. We have to be actively working on changing our ways and changing the way we look at things. Okay? Changing the way we look at things and changing the way we behave is 99.99% of what we do in religious science. We just apply it to everything. It's not limited to um, social justice issues. And so I get that this might be challenging. I get that you know, 2020, I think this might be the one year I stay up on New Year's. Not because I like celebrating New Year's, but I just want it over. I want it done. I want to be back in my nice, soft, comfortable, air-conditioned office and my happy, where I know where everything is and I have drawers and I have the scissors and I know where the pens are. Is anyone else there? We all want to be back in the sanctuary. I get it. I get it. And the divine is forcing us to look at this thing that we have been praying for all along, a chance to practice oneness. So here's the thing. Albert Einstein once wrote, no problem can be solved from the same level of consciousness that created it. No problem can be solved from the same level of consciousness that created it. And so we have to be willing to see more. We have to be willing to raise consciousness in order to understand that there is more going on here than we previously understood. One of the traditional ways of looking at this, actually, this is just so basic. If you think about the movie Wizard of Oz, when Dorothy is in Kansas, everything's in black and white. Every, she is unhappy. Somebody's going after her dog. It's the middle of the Great Depression. She doesn't feel heard, and she's trying to escape. Now, she gets some signs and some, some hints from other people. Um, and 
what ends up happening because she told the universe she wanted to up level. She wanted to not be stuck in this black and white world anymore. So what happens? There's a twister. It looks like a mess and it looks terrifying. It looks like chaos. And so she gets up leveled without knowing it. And when she's still in her home, once the, the twister puts her down in Oz, everything is still black and white. She can still not see color because she has not stepped into that world. But the moment she opens up that door, there's color. There's music. There's adventure. There is still stuff working against her. I mean, the, the Wicked Witch is famous for, you know, going after her poor little dog, Toto. She gets to meet the Lollipop Guild. She gets to... um be welcomed into Munchkinland and then make new friends who are very, very different from her. There's a lot of trivia out there about, um, about the Wizard of Oz. Interestingly, and I see this at a meta level, the Wizard of Oz was a flop when it was first brought out in 1938. It wasn't until it got put on TV in the mid-50s that all of a sudden it became this iconic TV show. So we have to give ourselves some time to get through the twister, to get through getting our feet back up under us and moving into a bigger, brighter world with color and all sorts of good things. We have to be patient with ourselves as we go through that particular process. So, you know, we are being patient with each other as we figure out the computers. We're being patient with each other as we begin to understand what each other needs. I'm so happy that there's some people who have volunteered to literally take their phone and put it up to the computer so that people without computers can listen in today. This is the true meaning of community. This is what those of you who joined the community today are stepping into. There is no need for any one person to do it all and all of us can do something. This is community. It, it's significant to me that Dorothy didn't walk the, go, the yellow brick road alone. She walked it with companions who were each flawed in their own way, but who could walk it with her. And each of them had their own way of looking at things, so they were able to see more of the land of Oz. So back to the idea of being colorblind. When one is colorblind, there, there's a test that test and we've all seen it I mean they're on Facebook now for heaven's sakes there's a circle and it's got dots in it and if you can see the colors you can see that there's a different color set of dots that make a letter or a number if you cannot see that color you have no idea that there's information there for you you have no idea with some people they they're they're limited um, rather famously, to black clothing. They'll only wear black because they know it matches and um, they're never sure what other colors they might be wearing and heaven forbid they end up in some weird combination. One of the great things that has happened is that a group called Enchroma, I believe that's the name of the glasses or the company, they make these glasses now and if you've watched it on video, what, you, what we see, I mean, there's all of this, it's out there on the net, People get their grandfather or their kid or whatever um, a set of these glasses and they put them on and take them outside and show them balloons of all different colors and the grass and the sky and, um, you know, they actually get to see what their, what their parents or their kids really look like and what color their eyes really are. And I've never seen a video where someone whips them off and says, well, this is horrible. Now I have to get used to color. Generally, there is an opening up that happens. There's, a, there's, there's tears, but they're happy tears. They're tears of joy, tears of awe at, at the beauty of the world. And so I would suggest to you that we as religious scientists, we often focus on the twister and the messiness it takes to get us to a world where there is color. But if we can remember that what we're really doing is up-leveling, and adding to the good that is in the world by 
being willing to see more of it, being aware of and in celebration of people of color stops feeling like a chore. Yes, we do have to actually look at what what is in the world in order to to look through it and see God. But there's a good reason we're looking at it right now. We can look at things that are problematic in order to realize that there's a better way of doing life. And what we focus on is that better way. What is it in my behavior that I can change right now that allows me to up level and live in the land of Oz rather than black and white, Great Depression era Kansas? Thomas Troward, who was one of our uh, one of the great teachers in this movement before our once wrote, the law of flotation was not discovered by studying the sinking of things. The law of flotation was not discovered by studying the sinking of things. Now, this is a mistake that was made early on in the field of psychology as well. People studied people who were sick. And so all we knew of psychology was what was wrong with us. I could, you know, the old joke is after 20 years of doing the Freudian work, you're no, you're no saner than you were, but now you know why you're neurotic and exactly what size and shape it is. As we got into the 1960s and, and psychology began to mature, people figured out that we should be looking at the opposite end of the spectrum. What is the absolute best of us? And so a guy by the name of Abraham Maslow comes onto the scene. And what he learns is that by studying people he calls self-actualized, he can see the, the very tippy top of our possibility. And that's what we're doing now. That's what we are choosing to do now. Not react in fear, not react with this is awful, but go into this as if it's our new set of, of uh glasses that allow us to see the greater world as it really is in living color. Sometimes that's hard and we're all going to get there at different rates. Sometimes people will be resistant to that change. At one point in my life, I was attending a, believe it or not, I was a born again Christian and I was attending an evangelical church and it was a church. That was a few problems with it. And then one day, the pastor who was up on the platform started talking about he had been to a museum and he and his friends, other ministers, were taken through this museum and shown a picture of the, go the Hindu goddess Kali. And... I don't know what was going on with the docent that day, but apparently she was in a bad mood. And all he remembers seeing was the destroyer. Um, how he describes what the docent says doesn't sound like the Kali I know. And so what he saw really was this bare-breasted female character with blue black skin and forearms standing on top of some poor guy. And in one hand, she has a dripping sword. And in another hand, she has a severed head and there's two more arms. And if you look, her skirt is made out of arms and hands. Sometimes there's a necklace of skulls. If I was just walking up to that I, and didn't know anything about what it all meant, I would see something horrible too. Here's the thing. If I showed you a picture of a man in his maybe who's maybe almost 30 years old who has been tortured and is now nailed to a piece of wood while other people stand around watching and no one's helping him you're going to be pretty horrified too until and unless you understand that this is Jesus the Christ and his crucifixion is a beautiful thing because we know about the resurrection if you're just looking at the crucifixion, all, you're in the middle of that twister with Dorothy. I never thought of Dorothy as being crucified, but there you go. She is. 
You haven't stepped out into the resurrection yet. Here's what I know about Kali because I chose to put on the glasses and read and get some wisdom about what Kali Ma really is. She is fierce, fierce motherly love. Lord Shiva is who she's standing on because he is the support for this beautiful act of creation that she is doing. They are at the end of the battle and he, their allies. And the reason she is standing that way um, is because the sword has cut through all ignorance. And um, no, the sword cuts through del uh, delusions and the head is the mask of ignorance. It is all that stuff we have been trying to get rid of his bad habits forever anyway. She has come in and rescued us from ignorance and delusion. Now, her other two hands, although most people wouldn't know it because most of us don't know many mudras, which is how you place hands and it has very specific meaning. One of the mudras that she has uh, the other two of her four hands in, it says, fear not. And the other one is extended in blessing. This is Mama Bear coming to rescue her babies from this place that feels so difficult. Her skin is considered the color of mystery, uh, a starless sky that is so deep and so rich, it is impossible to see through. There is a deep, deep mystery about Kali. And that, that skirt made out of arms and hands, that's the karma of her devotees that is freely given. This is my bad karma and I am giving it up to you, Kali Ma, because I know you can free me of it. How different is that? It's like a whole new world. It's like we took a picture of someone that was either horrible or being tortured and shoved them out of the black and white world into the light, the light, and gave a whole new, richer, deeper, more wonderful meaning to life as a whole. This is what we do as religious scientists. This is who we are. We are the ones who have agreed at a soul level somewhere to come together in the name of love and do the hard work of rising up in consciousness, even though it feels like we're caught in a storm, and do this work so that we, humanity as a whole, can step into the next level of consciousness. We can pull people up. We can be pulled up by people who have gone before. There's no, this is not a race. Wow, talking about race issues. This is not a race and this is not a sprint, guys. This is a marathon. This is a an infi infinite time, infinitely long time in which we can grow bigger and better and more beautiful and more loved and more loving over time. Now that might sound tiring to some people, because we're looking, you know, if you look at your feet while you're running a race, it gets tiring. But if you have your eyes on what's, what's around the next corner, what's beyond the next horizon, it's just exciting to find that as good as my life is right now, just you wait. Just you wait. God's up to something. And the universe is conspiring on our behalf. Ernest Holmes said we should be for something and against nothing. I am for whatever's around the next corner and for being truly present with whatever is right now in all its glory and in all its messiness and in the question of what is mine to do with this. So Reverend Gregory Toole, um, I'm not even going to try and scroll this through the, through the, the messages, but Reverend Gregory Toole shared a prayer he has pulled together as he does a lot of work with um, race issues. He is a man of color. He is one of our ministers. He usually goes into centers that are struggling and are between ministers and helps them get back on track, helps them rise up into their next, next incarnation as a center. And what he, he writes is how it's a great commentary on how to be in the midst of the storm right now. And what he writes is, some people will do their work in the trenches. It's good work. It is necessary. I applaud it. 
Some people will do their work in the lofty heights of spiritual fruit. It is good work. It is necessary. I applaud it. Some people will do their work in the trenches while at the same time never compromising spiritual truth and never forgetting that which transcends conditions. It is good work. It is necessary. I applaud it. The work that we do, people are going to take on different parts of the work and approach it in different ways. All of us get to live in this life of color. All of us get to go from being colorblind to living in a world where everybody gets to have their color and we get to see a world full of color and a world full of wonder and joy. And the way we do this is through prayer. And so in this moment, I'm going to ask you to just be comfortable in however that looks for you. Just sink into yourself and spend a moment just loving all of the good that is within your skin. Everything that works exactly as it should, all of the wonderful things you are, all of the wonderful things that are becoming within you. This is what we call the divine presence. And so I speak my word of prayer now for all of us who are living already within the divine presence, and that would be everyone. I know that there is a divine spirit within animating everyone, everywhere, all the time. God is, and God is all there is. God is all ranges of color, even those which the human eye cannot see. God is vast creation, the deep, deep mystery of that inky black starry night, and also the, the power to let go of, to free us from our own delusions and our old karma and our false thoughts, which is another way of saying sin. It frees us to see each other and in all of our glory. This is the spirit of heaven. This is the magnificent of magnificence of our souls which are part of God and so in this moment I speak a word of prayer I speak a word of truth about our our human family about the new members of the Center for Spiritual Living Prescott and about all of us as we walk this beautiful path together as we rise up together in order to live in the light to find the good and more good that is ours that we ought to have I celebrate that all we are doing is beginning to see the world for what it really is and loving it. Just as Grace said in her meditation earlier, we choose to see the world as it is and love it because all of it is the divine, is the divine in form. And as I stand witness to this, it is now pulled even more front and center and the volumes turned up on it in our consciousness and more and more good takes form at the level of effect, which is the human level, which is the, the physical world. I celebrate that this is what spirit is and what spirit does, has always been doing and will not ever stop evolving into something even better. I bless it all and call it good and very good. And so it is. <laughs>